Ambassador, thank you so much for taking the time, especially this week. We really appreciate it. Um, if you could, just big picture, what exactly is the UN General Assembly? What happens here this week? I know for a lot of New Yorkers, it means traffic and road closures. Yes. But in a real sense, what is the business that goes on here uh, this week? Well, you know, they call this a Super Bowl of diplomacy, and it truly is the Super Bowl of diplomacy because we have leaders from all over the world who gather here in New York this week to talk about issues of peace and security, to talk about climate change, uh, to talk about poverty and how we address the sustainable development goals. This is the time when we work on problems that impact the globe. And so it's exciting to have the president coming in, Secretary Blinken, as well as other cabinet members who will be participating in meetings with leaders from elsewhere around the world. Speaking of issues that are happening around the world right now, what is your top priority? And we've got uh, a lot going on. We're in year two of a war in Ukraine, the Middle East, uh, almost a year now of a war there. Uh, instability in Haiti, Sudan, the biggest humanitarian crisis right now in the world. So what is your top priority for this week? Uh, you name them. <laughs> uh, President Sirleaf used to talk about when I was ambassador to Liberia, the priorities of the priorities. And this is what we're going to be dealing with, the priorities of the priorities. So first and foremost, it is about peace and security. It's about finding solutions to bringing peace to the tens of millions of people who are being impacted by war. So we will be focusing on Ukraine. We will be focusing on Gaza. We will be focusing on Sudan, where we're experiencing the largest humanitarian crisis uh, in the world. And of course, there are other priorities as well in the context of peace and security. So that's at the top of our, our list. Second, we're looking at broadly how to rebuild the humanitarian system. The humanitarian system uh, around the world uh, has been stretched beyond its limits uh, as organizations try to deal with issues that are a consequence of war, a consequence of climate change. So we will be working on you know, how to ensure that humanitarian workers uh, have access uh, that they actually can get into areas and provide security without their lives being threatened. Uh, we will be looking at how we provide them with the resources that they need. And then thirdly, you may have heard that I spoke at CFR uh, a couple weeks ago about UN reform. We will be talking about how we reform the United Nations system that is now more than 70 years old. Uh, and really not fit for purpose for the world that we live in today, how we make that system more inclusive, including ensuring that Africa has a voice in the Security Council where they do not have a permanent seat. And I have a, a fourth priority that I've added, and that is engaging with young people. And I know that your audience is an audience of young people. So starting on, on yesterday, I met with two separate groups of, of young people, uh, young uh, individuals out of the New York area in a group called the Explorers who want to work in the security sector. And our diplomatic security uh, office ha has engaged them every year and I've spoken to them every single year. And then I invited a group of about 15 young people here to the residents yesterday to talk about their priorities because I want to amplify their voices. Uh, they're gonna be the future, it's not gonna be us. Uh, it's going to be them. And what I heard from all of them, and they were, they were uh, the majority of them were from Hawaii. I had uh, two young people who had participated uh, in the demonstrations at Columbia uh, related to Gaza. I had a young woman who has been involved in politics since she was nine. She's met over 30 uh, leaders from around the world and she's promoting uh, the issue of uh, early marriages for uh, young people. And what I heard from them is you have to deal with climate change because that's our future that you guys are leaving 
behind for us. So climate change has to be at the top of your list. And, and I, I told them, I promised them I was going to amplify their voices. And that's something that no one country can solve on its own. No one country can solve on its own. And it's not something we can solve overnight because it wasn't created overnight. Well, you mentioned UN reform, and I know, as you spoke about, it's really important to you. Um, but it does beg the question, because you do have Iran, for example, that sits on the Human Rights Council, and we know what's going on in that country. They have morality police that are arresting women who don't have enough hair, uh, who aren't covered enough on their head. Uh, you've got Russia, which has veto power and just invaded a sovereign country. UN women took months to even acknowledge that there was sexual violence and rape on October 7th committed by Hamas. How do you convince Americans that the UN is still a credible and valuable and important organization? Well, first and foremost, the UN is a valuable organization. And I all, whenever I'm asked this question, I remember uh, what Secretary Albright said. If we didn't have the UN today, we would create it. Because the UN does have impact, because it provides a platform for the world to call out people who are committing human rights violations. So Iran may be sitting on the Human Rights Council, but they're not sitting there in comfort. They are being called out for what they are doing. Uh, Russia, sitting in the Security Council, they are being called out every single day for what they are doing. And I am still proud that we were able to get 141 countries to condemn Russia to condemn their actions in Ukraine. And we are dealing with some incredibly difficult issues. Dealing with the situation in Gaza has been probably the most difficult issue that I have ever dealt with as, uh, as a diplomat. We were able to get the Security Council to support President Biden's uh, peace uh, ceasefire deal and, uh, and give time for us to try to push forward that deal. And we're continuing to work on that every single day. There is some reporting that uh, even some top U.S. officials do not feel like a ceasefire hostage agreement will happen within the Biden administration. Do you think that that's an accurate assessment? And how does that change what you do? I think they can't predict the future. What I can say, and I heard this directly uh, from the president, he has not given up and he is continuing with the entire team to push for this ceasefire deal. And what that means for me is that I have to keep pushing for it. I have to keep engaging with my colleagues on the Security Council. I have to keep engaging with uh, the Arab group, uh, engaging with Israel and others to do the work that the president started for us, and that is push forward a ceasefire deal so that we can get hostages out, so that we can help Palestinians who are suffering mightily uh, in Gaza. I am really dreading October 7 because it's going to bring back all of the horror and sadness that we felt when um, we woke up on the morning of October 8th and saw that Israel had suffered such a horrific uh, attack. So that means we have to keep working on it. We can never give up. If you give up, you're not gonna, going to achieve. So those who are saying this is not going to be achieved before the end of the Biden administration, they can't predict the future. And they have to join the, the president and the entire national security team in working to make this happen. The fighting, especially now between Israel and Hezbollah, is only intensifying. How concerned are you about a wider regional war, which is something you have been working for months to prevent? In fact, we started out saying we have to present, uh, prevent this war from spreading. Uh, we have to prevent escalation, and that is still our message that we have to prevent escalation of this war because it can have huge, a huge regional uh, impact and, and impacts so many other people around the world. So it's the message we're continuing to deliver to both Israel, to Hezbollah, that they have to pull back 
from uh, taking this war into a full-blown war. Uh, the people uh, on the Israeli side of the, the border with, uh, with Lebanon uh, need to be able to return safely to their homes. And the Lebanese people on the Lebanon side of the border have to be able to live in security as well. And so escalation will uh, really uh, prevent both of them from achieving that. I also want to talk about the humanitarian crisis in Sudan right now. 20 million people, the numbers are staggering. So you've got 20 million people who are displaced, famine, uh, experts say on the verge of genocide. What is happening there? Why is it not getting the attention that it deserves? And what are you doing from a diplomatic end to improve the situation? Well, first and foremost, I have been raising the profile of this. I started out early in the year with a, an op-ed piece that I put in the New York Times, and I described it as silence, because we were not hearing about what was happening uh, in Sudan. And it clearly needed to have more uh, press attention, which it was not getting. It needed to have more diplomatic attention uh, than it was getting. And so we have pushed this issue in the Security Council. Uh, we have also been very actively engaged in trying to bring the two parties to the negotiating table. There were meetings in Geneva over the past month that uh, really attempted to push the agenda for peace forward. Uh, the two sides are not engaging in any um, consistent way in trying to find a solution. And we need to do this for the tens of millions of people who are being impacted. I travel to the border of, uh, on the Chadian side with Sudan. I saw the women and children crossing that border. I talked to young women who had gone through rape, who told me their ambitions and their hopes and dreams for the future had been destroyed by this war. And this is a war between two men fighting over power. And we have to, we have to uh, end that uh, as quickly as possible. And it's gonna take all of us. It's going to take uh, partners in the region. It's going to take the UN. It's going to take the African Union to bring all of our resources to the table to pressure the, the two sides to end this carnage. Do you think that it's just that between Ukraine and the Middle East, it's kind of sucking the oxygen out of the room, that there's just not enough attention? Why is it that you think that there's just not enough attention being given to this? You know, I do place? think that's part of it. It's Africa. Uh, Africa never gets the attention uh, that it, it needs. So yes, Ukraine and Gaza. And I had people say to me, how can you talk about Sudan when you see what is happening in Gaza? And my response is, how can we forget Sudan when we see what is happening in Sudan. We can't parcel out our attention to misery. Uh, we have to be able to focus on everything that's happening, all of the conflicts, because when you look at agony, uh, you look at suffering, and you look at misery, uh, there is no equality. So all ambassadors and diplomats I know have their own strategies uh, for getting things done. You have been called the gumbo diplomat, and that is the soup. Yes. Uh, so can you just explain a little bit about that and, and how it touches upon your own personal story? You know, I am a people person. It is, um, you know, I call that my superpower. Uh, so I can talk to people uh, wherever they are. Uh, I don't know how I developed this, so I thought, you know, it, it has to be the gumbo diplomacy. <laughs> it has to be sitting around a, a dinner table or standing around a kitchen, as I used to do in Liberia and had President Sirleaf and her entire uh, cabinet over to, to my residence for gumbo. And when I'm making gumbo, usually, you know, I need help. And so I have people in the kitchen sort of watching, and you start talking and you forget that you have issues with each other and you talk through problems and you develop a relationship that becomes a friendship. And friendships help you to move agendas forward. So I have been able to do that with friends and foes 
And uh, so I, I consider my gumbo my super two, my superpower. Uh, and I try to use it whenever I can. And it's not always gumbo. Sometimes it's just sitting having tea together. Uh, it's sitting having a conversation with people who you might disagree with. Uh, and finding that little tiny commonality that you might have with each other. And it may be so tiny. You have grandchildren who are exactly the same age. And I can say, you have to do this for your grandchild. And the person knows that I know who their grandchild is. And being able to pick up the phone and call people at any hour, and I can do that. I'm on my phone uh, sometimes at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning. I take phone calls at 6 in the morning. And people know that I'm available. Uh, and I will take their calls, and I will respond to them. I don't always give them the response they want, and I'm not always nice. Although <laughs> I, niceness is also my other superpower, but sometimes I know that you, you have to tweak your niceness a bit to get the message uh, across. But whether I'm not being nice or I'm being nice, people know that I am always willing to listen. You've been in this um, position for almost four years now. I'm wondering, if, is there anything that has surprised you? Because as you talk about these personal relationships that are so important, there are countries that on a world stage may not speak to each other or have a relationship. But do you ever see anything kind of behind the scenes where maybe a diplomat from one country that maybe not have formal relations with another, they're talking or they're getting coffee? Is there anything like that that gives you a little hope? And are you seeing those personal relationships behind the scenes? I am seeing those personal relationships behind the scenes, and I have those personal relationships behind the scenes. And so occasionally I can say uh, to one of those countries where we may not have a friendly public relationship, like the cameras are not rolling. Let's be honest with each other. What were you thinking? <laughs> right. Why would you do that? And get an honest answer back. Um, it, it's really fascinating stuff. Um, just in conclusion, if there's one thing that you would like our audience to know about the UN, about what happens this week, uh, any message that you have? You know, the UN is not a perfect institution. It has its weaknesses and flaws like any huge organization. But the work of the UN is important. It's important for all of us. It's important for world peace. It's important for people in the world who are facing all kinds of trauma. The people in Gaza, the people in Sudan, the people in, uh, who are facing the impact of climate change want to know that they have not been forgotten on the world stage and the US here in New York, if the UN is able to be, say that to the world, that we have not forgotten you. All right. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Really appreciate it. We do need the gumbo recipe at some point. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're willing to share it. <laughs> uh, I am willing to share the gumbo recipe. I did. It's in the Washington Post. Uh, if you pull up gumbo diplomacy, you will find the recipe. And I've talked to several people who have used the recipe. And they've told me that it was very good. And I had gumbo from someone who used the recipe, and it was better than the gumbo that I made. Well, that is a very high compliment to them. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your yeah. time. Thank you.